Our gospel reading this morning is from Mark 5, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue came, named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it, but the woman knowing what had happened to her came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from, from the house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and the child's father and mother and those who were with him and, and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them to tell that no one should know this and gave, told them to give her something to eat. Ever since human beings conceived of a being or beings greater than themselves who created and control the universe, they've been asking this question. It's probably the oldest question in the book. How do we reconcile the goodness and power of God with the suffering and evil that exists in the world? Where is God in the midst of suffering, in the midst of evil, illness, and death? There's a fancy theological term for this, theodicy. And in the history of Christianity, entire libraries of books and scholarly theological articles have been written to try and answer these questions. And in all of my studies, I have yet to find one that to me gives a truly satisfactory or sufficient answer to those questions. It's one of the things I continue to wrestle with on my faith faith journey. And it's one of the things that I intend to ask God when I see God face to face at the end of my life. I accept that suffering, illness, evil, and death are, inevitable, are an inevitable part of the world that we live in. Few people ever get through life without some sort of hardship, grief, or suffering. Faith is not about controlling or manipulating God so that everything will go well in life. Belief in God, worshiping God, having a relationship with God, living a holy life does not mean that one won't experience suffering or encounter evil. 
but I don't believe that suffering is ever God-given or God-sent. So lesson one in life that I've learned is I am not in control. Now, I may feel as if I am in control when things are going well and all is right with my world. But when things go wrong, when my life or the life of someone I care about goes off the rails, my sense of control is threatened or even shattered. When that happens to any of us, we may feel desperate and despairing. So when life goes wrong, how do we move from despair to hope? We see this movement from despair to hope clearly in our gospel reading this morning. Immediately before our passage this morning, Jesus has been across the Sea of Galilee in the country of the Gerasenes. A non, that's non-Jewish territory. You'll have to read the story for yourself, but what Jesus did there so frightened the people of the nearby town that they literally beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. So in spite of having just arrived, Jesus and his disciples get back in the boat and go back across to the other side of the lake. Yet their arrival seems to have been anticipated because a large crowd gathers around them just as soon as they arrive. And Jesus encounters human need the moment he steps off the boat. Out of the crowd steps Jairus, who is introduced by, both by his name and by his status. He's not just one of the crowd, but is a respected and powerful leader of the synagogue, a man accustomed to being in control. But at the moment, he is most decidedly not in control and is not acting as a leader of the synagogue but as a desperate father who sets aside all dignity and literally throws himself at Jesus feet, begging repeatedly for the life of his daughter. His request is clear and direct. My daughter is dying, come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Jairus despairs of his daughter's life, but he has hope that Jesus can do something to save her. And without a single question, without even a word, Jesus goes with him, accompanied by his disciples and the pressing crowd. Now, Jairus is no doubt relieved at Jesus' prompt response to his desperate plea, no doubt pushing his way through the crowd as fast as he can, hoping that if they hurry fast enough, Jesus will get there in time to save his daughter. But in that huge crowd around Jesus, there's a woman who is so also desperate for healing. And unlike Jairus, she's not, we're not told her name. She's not powerful or influential. She's simply identified as a woman with a flow of blood. She's had this sickness for 12 long years spent her life savings on doctors who could not or would not help her and in fact made her situation worse. She's desperate for a cure because according to Jewish law, as long as she has this flow of blood, she's unclean and cannot touch anyone else without making them ritually unclean. She can't worship in the synagogue or temple. She can't live with or even touch members of her own family and she isn't even supposed to be going out in public. So for 12 years, she's been socially isolated. She's nearly the opposite mirror of Jesus, uh, of Jairus, in comparison to the privileged and powerful and male synagogue leader, this woman has nothing, not even a name. Her vulnerability is fully exposed, and unlike Jairus, she can only cross the border between despair and hope in secret. Somehow she has heard about a prophet who can heal people. That's probably about as much as she knows about Jesus, but she figures she doesn't have anything to lose. So she seeks him out, only to find him surrounded by a huge crowd. 
Like Jairus, she is desperate and like him believes that Jesus has power to bring the healing that she so desperately needs. And so she plunges into the crowd, reaching toward Jesus in desperate hope, attempt, attempting to touch just the hem of his outer cloak. And at last, she gets close enough that she's able to reach out and brush his hem. And immediately, she knows in her body that she is healed. But immediately and simultaneously, Jesus also knows that power has gone out of him. And much to Jairus' dis dismay, Jesus stops in his tracks, looks around at the crowd and says, who touched me? His disciples look at him like he must be crazy. What do you mean, who touched me? You see the crowd around you. But Jesus keeps searching. And the woman, knowing that she's busted, comes out of the crowd and with trembling fear falls down at Jesus' feet and tells him the whole story. But rather than being impatient or angry, Jesus responds to the woman with kindness and reassurance, treating her with dignity and respect. He calls her daughter, a member of his own family, and tells her, it was your faith that made you whole. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. She is healed, set free of her disease, and once again part of the family. Mark then turns the story back to Jairus, standing there, practically jumping up and down, I would imagine, with impatience, that Jesus get moving again. But just as Jesus' parting words to the woman leave his mouth, Jairus' worst fears are confirmed when a messenger comes and informs him that he doesn't need to bother Jesus anymore because his daughter, sadly, has died. Now, I can only imagine Jairus' feelings at that point, yet Jesus, standing at the crossroad between despair and hope, assures Jairus, do not fear, only keep on believing. Do not fear, only keep on believing. Then, dismissing the crowd and most of his disciples, Jesus continues on to Jairus' house with just Peter, James, and John. When those gathered at the house to mourn, laugh at him for wanting to see the child, Jesus sends them all away. And with just his three disciples and the child's parents as witnesses, Jesus raises the child with a few simple words. Little girl, I say to you, get up. And she does. Two stories about two very different women, one rich and the other poor, one young, one older, one from the right side of the tracks, the other a social outcast. And yet Jesus has time for both. For in God's eyes, they are equally precious and equally worthy. So both receive the healing they so desperately need. Jairus and the unnamed woman cross over from despair to hope because they had faith in Jesus' healing power. In these two accounts, the faith that Jairus and the unnamed woman had in Jesus bring about the physical healing that they seek. The woman is cured. The child is raised back to life. Physical healing can and often does happen. We know that. We've experienced it, either for ourselves or for someone we care about. But we also know that sometimes the physical healing we pray and hope for doesn't come. So these two stories can raise the question, why do some people experience physical healing and others don't? The synagogue leaders, the daughter was raised, but other children died. A desperate woman was plagued by years of illness and was restored, but equally desperate men and women who struggle with chronic pain and illness are not. 
Why are some people healed and others not? And the answer I have for you today is simply this. I don't know. I simply don't know. But I do know, and I have witnessed many times, that even when physical healing doesn't happen, other forms of healing often do. Healing, renewal, and restoration of relationships can happen when illness or suffering brings individuals, families, churches, or communities together. Spiritual and emotional healing can be experienced by people in the midst of illness and suffering through finding acceptance and peace, releasing fear and renewing trust in God. Moving from despair to hope. And sometimes, of course, we all know that the ultimate healing is death. When someone whose body is simply too sick or injured to continue is released from their suffering in this life so that they can experience the healing and wholeness of new life in Christ. And just as Jesus was there for the woman and that young girl, Jesus is often there for us, even though we and those we care about may not be physically healed or brought back to life. That's where faith comes in. Both Jairus and the hemorrhaging woman saw Jesus through the eyes of faith. It is faith that causes Jairus to set aside any dignity and throw himself at Jesus' feet, believing that Jesus can heal his daughter. And it is faith that propels the woman to move toward Jesus in the midst of that huge crowd believing that she will be cured of her hemorrhage. It is as we look at Jesus through the eyes of faith that we are able to see that God is indeed present in the midst of our suffering and move from hope, to, from despair to hope. It is able, when we are able to look through the eyes of faith that we are able to see that God suffers with us. That God is a God of infinite possibilities. And it is, and it, it is God who is able to bring healing and new life and hope even in the most difficult of circumstances. In this life, we often live at the crossroads between hope and despair. And it is at this intersection that we are called to trust Jesus' words to Jairus. Do not fear, only keep on believing. Not everyone we pray for will be healed. Illness will still attack, those, attack us and those we care about. Terror and violence and evil will continue to find their way in the world. In the midst of all of this, however, we are called to testify to what we do know in Jesus Christ. Do not fear, only keep on believing. Believe that God is with us. Believe that God is for us. Believe that in the midst of suffering, evil, and death, God is still at work in the world and in our lives. Believe that through the power of Jesus' resurrection, evil, despair, and even death itself will ultimately be defeated. However strong they may seem now, Jesus' resurrection means that they do not have the last word in our world or in our lives. On this winter Sunday, in the midst of a time of sickness and death, division and disruption, in the face of grief, anger, fear, and despair, these are the words we can hold on to. 
These are the words we are called to share. Do not fear, only keep on believing. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.